Uh, hi, my name is Caitlin Cottle, and I worked on the Dynamic Soil Properties for Soil Health Project in North Carolina at North Carolina State University. I worked with Deanna Osman, Josh Heitman, and Matt Ricker. And this presentation is Soil Health Metrics and Sea Soil Soils Under Tillage and Hay Systems. So soil, uh, soils are important because they carry out many important ecosystem services, such as filtering water, providing nutrients for plants, providing a habitat for organisms, storing carbon, and cycling nutrients. And the healthier soil is, the better it's able to carry out these services. And you can measure soil health many different ways, either through different metrics or different protocols for the same metrics. And the objectives in North Carolina address some of these differences. We had three separate objectives, and the first was to identify differences in soil health status across sea soil soils under two extremes of land management systems. We chose sea soil soils because it's a common soil under agricultural production in North Carolina, and sea soil is part of a soil family that's very common across the Southeast US. Our two land management systems were a row crop system with tillage and a hayland system. And again, these are two common um, cropping systems in North Carolina. The second objective was to assess proposed indicator variability between systems within the systems, within fields, and with depth. And the third objective was to compare measurements of the same soil properties. Our soils were sampled in March of 2018 using a Giddings probe. Five cores were collected at each sample location and divided by depth to 100 centimeters. And those depths were zero to five centimeters, five to 10 centimeters, to the bottom of the A, which was typically about 15 to 20 centimeters, to the bottom of the BT, which was about 40 centimeters, and then the BT to horizon, which was 200 centimeters. Bulk samples were homogenized and air dried, and natural fabric samples were also collected and air dried, and natural fabric samples were meant to represent a naturally occurring aggregate that you might get off a pit face. We used a split strip design where the split plots were our individual sample locations within a field. We used a split plot to represent the spatial variability between the sample locations. And our strip plots were our depths, which were um, nested in our split plots. Our field served as replicates we had three hay fields and three crop fields. And you can kind of see our statistical design in this image. And we used a mixed model in SAS with a PROC Limits command. Anything was to, uh, determined to be statistically significant at an alpha level of 0 0.05. And these are some of the results. Uh, this is a table of all the biological, chemical, and physical properties that we measured. Um, this is the standard list that NRCS gave us. Only one test or metric is able to detect a difference between the two systems, and that was carbon respiration. No metric was able to detect a difference between the sample locations or the individual pedons but all of the tests were able to detect a difference with depth. We also had several interactions. Um, permanganate oxidizable carbon, beta glucosidase, acid phosphatase, aryl sulfatase, total nitrogen, AC protein content, and NRCS aggregate stability had system by depth interactions. Permanganate oxidizable carbon had a system by pedon interaction and beta glucose aminidase had a system by depth by pet on interaction. I'll go through some of these interactions or main effects in more detail, but I won't cover all of them. We measured infiltration two different ways using, the first was using the Cornell sprinkle infiltrometer, which is represented by the blue bars in this graph. And the second was the single ring infiltrometer, which is represented by the red, red bars in this graph. Neither infiltration measurement had any significant differences between sample locations or between the systems. And that's likely due to the amount of variability within the measurements themselves, which you can see that in this graph. 
on the y-axis is infiltration rate in centimeters per hour, and the x-axis has each individual sample location. I included two forest locations, which we use to represent a undisturbed sisal soil, but these, uh, the forest locations were included in the statistical analysis. So as you can see, there's a large amount of variability in the single ring measurements uh, through the crop and hay systems, but it is in the forest measurements as well. And there's a variability within the Cornell measurement as well. And there's a lot of differences between the two measurements. So there's not a lot of agreement between the Cornell infiltration measurement and the single ring measurement. So organic carbon and total nitrogen were measured. On the left, we have soil organic carbon, which had a depth mean effect. On the y-axis, we have percent weight carbon. And on the x-axis, we have our individual depths and horizons. And here you can see that overall soil organic carbon decreased with depth, which was the trend that we expected to see. On the right, we have total nitrogen, which had a system by depth interaction. On the y-axis, we have our percent weight nitrogen. And the x-axis is the same. Here, crop system is represented by the red bars and the hay system is represented by the blue bars. And this will be carried throughout the rest of the presentation. So again, we're seeing that total nitrogen is decreasing with depth, but there was a significant difference between the two systems at the zero to five centimeter depth where the hay system had higher total nitrogen content than the crop system. Carbon respiration was also measured and it had two main effects. On the left, we have the system main effect. On the y-axis is milligrams of carbon dioxide per gram of soil. And on the x-axis is the individual systems. And you can see that the crop system had higher respiration than the hay system. This was unexpected to see. Uh, carbon respiration is a soil health metric that operates on a more is better basis, meaning that a higher value represents a healthier soil. And this is not what we saw with our data. On the right, we have the depth main effect. The y-axis is the same and the x-axis has our individual depths or horizons. And here again, we can see that carbon respiration is decreasing depth. Permanganate oxidizable carbon had a system by pedon interaction and a system by depth interaction. On the left is the system by pedon interaction. On the y-axis is milligrams of carbon per kilogram of soil, and the x-axis represents the individual sample locations. The C sample location represents the highest uh, elevation sample location in the field. B is about a midpoint, and the A sample location is the lowest within the field. So if you look at the A sample location, there's a significant difference between the crop and hay system where the crop system had more oxidizable carbon than the hay system. This is likely due to some erosion that was occurring within the field, which was visible when we sampled. And this erosion was carrying sediment and maybe organic matter down the slope. On the right, we have the system by depth interaction, which has where the y-axis is the same and the x-axis as our individual depths or horizons. Overall, you can see that oxidizable carbon is decreasing with depth. And statistically, there's a difference. Um, and visually, there's a difference. But realistically, there wasn't much difference from the 0 to 5 centimeter depth to the BT horizon. And our values range from about 717 milligrams of carbon per kilogram of soil to about 714. We measured six different enzymes. The first we'll look at is beta-glucosidase, which had a system by depth interaction. On the y-axis, we have our enzyme activity, and on the x-axis is our depths or horizons. Here again, we can see that the trend of decreasing metric value with depth is uh, seen with this data as well. But we see a difference between the crop and hay system at the 0 to 5 centimeter depth, where the hay system is significantly higher than the crop system. We also measured beta-glucosaminidase, which had a system by depth by pedon interaction. On the y-axis, we have our enzyme activity again, and the x-axis has the individual 
sample locations with the depths at those locations. Here you can see the enzyme activity is decreasing the depth again, but overall there's not a specific trend or pattern that we could pick out for this data. We measured acid phosphatase and alkaline phosphatase, but cecil soils are acidic, so acid phosphatase performed a little bit better. We have a system by depth interaction. And on the y-axis, we have our enzyme activity again. And the x-axis is the individual depths or horizons. Again, we see the trend of decreasing enzyme activity with depth. And we have the same significant difference at the zero to five centimeter depth where the hay system had higher enzyme activity than the crop system. We also measured aryl sulfatase, which had a system by depth interaction as well. Uh, the y-axis has our enzyme activity, x-axis has our depths and horizons. Enzyme activity is decreasing the depth, and we see the same significant difference as acid phosphatase and beta glucosidase of the hay system having higher enzyme activity than the crop system. Aggregate stability was measured two different ways. Um, the first we'll look at is ARS wet aggregate stability, which is on the left. And this was the method that had the nested sieves in the little dunk tubes. So it had a depth main effect. And on the y-axis, we have mean weight diameter in millimeters. And the x-axis is our individual depths and horizons. Uh, the depth main, depth main effect showed that there was mostly a significant difference between the surface and subsurface horizons, where the surface had a higher mean weight diameter than the subsurface. On the right, we have NRCS aggregate retention, which had a system by depth interaction. And this protocol had a single sieve that was measuring the aggregate retention after the aggregates were soaked overnight. So on the y-axis, we have percent aggregates retained and the x-axis is the same as before. Here again, we're seeing that the metric value is decreasing the depth but we can see a significant difference between the systems down to 10 centimeters, where the hay system had higher aggregate retention than the crop systems. We also measured many correlations between a lot of these metrics, and this table shows a few of them. So the bolded values are correlations that had an R factor greater than 0.7 and were statistically significant at an alpha level of 0.05. And looking at this table, you can see that the majority of these metrics were correlated to each other. And this might make some of the metrics that were measured redundant if they're showing the same trends in the data. So in conclusion, many metrics only found differences with depth and this was typically only in the zero to five centimeter depth. And there was one that had a difference in the five to 10 centimeter depth. And only one was able to differentiate between the systems. And that was carbon respiration. Metrics meant to represent similar soil processes showed different results and, have different and had different trends in data. And protocols provided by NRCS required further clarification and standardization and some of these protocols were labor intensive and time consuming and might not be suitable for the high throughput commercial settings. There were many people to thank with this project, but I would like to thank NRCS for their funding and Sky Wills and Debbie Anderson for their assistance with the protocols and with sampling. Thank you.